Chairman. It is um, an emotional occasion for me to come back to this hearing room. I learned a lot from you, uh, Chairman Dingell, when I uh, first came here in the fall of 1976 and then became a member of this committee and was sworn in in January uh, um, of 1977. And um, Chairman Gordon, thank you for your friendship all these years and for your leadership on this issue and so many others. And thank you for calling me on the telephone in Tennessee the day after the election last November when uh, you when it became clear that you were going to be chairing the Science and Technology Committee, and uh, you were the first to say, I want you to come and talk about this issue, and uh, we, we, want to, we want to work on it. And Chairman Dingell, thank you for calling me and inviting me to come uh, and testify as well. Uh, and to the ranking members, uh, thank you, uh, Congressman Barton, Congressman Hall. We were we were uh, close friends before uh, you went over to what we jokingly refer to as the dark side, and uh, and we're and we're friends uh, still. And I, I want to uh, acknowledge my friends on both sides. Uh, He's uh, threatening to come back over to your side, Mr. Uh, well, President. he'd be more he'd be more than welcome. He'd be more than welcome, uh, always. <laughs> uh, East Texas and Tennessee have a lot in a lot in common. And uh, uh, Chairman Voucher, thank you. We. Uh, worked just across the uh, state line for, for so many years, and I have many friends uh, uh, on, on both of the uh, committees that are represented here, and, and I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to, to testify before two committees that I did, in fact, ha have the privilege of serving on. Congressman Dingell, I want to say uh, a special word uh, of thanks to you uh, because our fathers uh, served together. Uh, this is the second generation uh, friendship. And I was um, reflecting yesterday uh, and doing just taking a pencil and paper, and at the time when uh, your father and my father served together in the House of Representatives, the concentrations of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere up here on Capitol Hill and all over the world were just about 300 parts per million. And uh, they, they really had never gone above 300 parts per million, at least as far back as a million years in the ice record. Uh, and yet here we are today, and it's already 383 parts per million, just in, uh, in that short span of time. Uh, and that ultimately is what brings me here. There is a sense of hope in this country that this United States Congress will rise to the occasion and present meaningful solutions to this crisis. This is the greatest country on the face of this earth, and the hopes for freedom and the viability and efficacy of self-government rest with the legislative branch of our, of our government in this day and time. There have been times in the past when, when our nation has been called upon to rise above partisanship, above uh, political calculations, above the pressures that have always been present for two and a quarter centuries to, uh, from special interests of this, that, or the other kind, and reach across the aisle and do what uh, history is calling upon all of us as Americans to do. America is the natural leader of the world, and our world faces a true planetary emergency. I know the phrase sounds shrill, and I know it's a challenge to the moral imagination to see and feel and understand that the entire relationship between humanity and our planet has been radically altered. We've quadrupled human population in less than one century, from 1.6 billion uh, in 1900 to 6.56 billion today. The population is stabilizing of its own accord as girls are educated and women are empowered and family planning uh, that's culturally acceptable in country after country becomes 
widely available, and most importantly, as child survival rates increase and infant and maternal mortality, mortality decreases. When those things happen, and especially when literacy among women increases around the world, the birth rates come down, the death rates come down, and then the birth rates come down, and it's stabilizing. But having multiplied by four the numbers of people on this planet, and we're going from uh, over six and a half now to over 9.1, uh, almost certainly within the next 40, 45 years, that in itself causes a big change in the relationship between uh, humanity and, and the planet. Secondly, our technologies are thousands of times more powerful than any our grandparents had at their disposal. And so even though we're uh, more skillful and more effective in doing the things we've always done, exploiting the earth for sustenance, providing for our families, and going about to productive lives, the side effects of what we're doing sometimes now outstrip the development of uh, extra wisdom to make sure that we handle these new powers in a way that doesn't do unintended harm. And somehow we've uh, also adopted a kind of a short-term way of thinking that uh, is also different from what our grandparents more commonly used. Uh, we, in the markets, uh, Congressman Bartlett said this is the global, global warming is the biggest market failure in history. I, I kind of agree with that. If you look at the markets, the short-term focus is just dominant now. Quarterly reports, day traders. If you look at uh, the entertainment business and the media business and even the news business, it's overnight polls and how many eyeballs can you glue to the screen. You know the phrases. And in the uh, honorable profession of politics, back in uh, that year when I first came to serve on these two committees, I never took a public opinion poll. Uh, and that was partly because back in those days it wasn't very common. And also, as Congressman Gordon knows, it's largely a rural district and you get out and meet people. And But that's all changed now. And by the time I left uh, politics, overnight uh, polls were were common. Now, as you all know, the so-called dial meters, it's just one big, long, continuous poll, and I don't think the results for our democracy are all that good. But this short-term focus is a part of the problem that we call the climate crisis. And we, we in the United States of America, and you in the Congress, are the repository of the hopes and dreams of people all across this earth. It's an unusual time. One of the popular movies out there now is 300, about the uh, small group that defended uh, a pass at Thermopylae to save the prospects for democracy. There are times, rare though they be, when a relatively small group is called upon to make decisions and show courage because the results of what they do will shape the prospects not only for themselves and for their kin, but for all future generations. This Congress is now the 535. Really and truly, it's one of those times. Congressman Dingell, you are perhaps the youngest member of the greatest generation, having fought in World War II as a very young man. And we owe you you and your generation, as we've all acknowledged many times, a great debt. But you were part of a relatively small group that saved the world. And when you and your colleagues on the ground and at sea and in the air won the struggle against global fascism and the Atlantic and the Pacific simultaneously. Your generation came back home transformed. No longer 19, 20, 21 year olds. Having walked through the fire, having emerged victorious, you came home with a different capacity for vision a deeper moral authority, 
And when your wartime leaders like George Marshall said, we ought to lift up our adversaries from their knees and walk with them from the battlefield toward peace and prosperity, we need a, a European Recovery Act that became known as the Marshall Plan. Your generation said yes. We don't want to have a repetition of these world wars coming out of Europe, but you knew it took vision and a 50-year time frame. The United Nations was established. Taxes were involved. The, the, the GI's uh, general said, Omar Bradley, he said, it's time that we steered by the stars and not by the lights of every passing ship. And your generation said, yes, that's right. And here in the Congress, Republicans, Arthur Vandenberg and others, stood up and reached across the aisle and said, we're Americans first. And Democrats reached across from the other side. And under presidents uh, of both parties, we stood down communism. And for 50 years, we were faithful to that mandate. I say all that, Mr. Chairman, because what we're facing now is a crisis that is by far the most serious we've ever faced. And the way we're going to solve it is by asking you on both sides of the aisle to do what some people have, as you know, begun to fear we don't have the capacity to do anymore. I, I know they're wrong. I know that politics uh, can seem frustratingly slow, like it doesn't move uh, an inch a year. But when there are enough people who become seized of the gravity of the challenge and talk with you, and, and you yourselves immerse yourselves in it and learn what's uh, at stake, all of a sudden it can move very quickly. I came here today, uh, Mr. Chairman, with some messages to the Congress, and they'll be delivered uh, to your offices. Uh, they're from 516,000 people who just in the last few days have responded to uh, an, an email request that I sent out to say uh, this hearing's been scheduled and I'd like to be able to tell the, the members of these committees that uh, I'm not here by myself. There are lots of Americans who, who feel as strongly as I do. Uh, and, and so the folks that have contacted algore.com, we've been getting 100 new contacts per second in the last couple of days. We just started this a short time ago. This is building, and it's building in both parties. The faith communities, the evangelical communities, the business leaders, 10 of the CEOs of the biggest corporations in America just the day before the State of the Union address last month. Most of them in their personal lives have been supporters of uh, President Bush. That's irrelevant uh, to this issue. They had a press conference the day before the State of the Union address calling on you to act. Adopt legislation that will address this crisis. This is not, these are not normal times. Congressman Gordon, uh, I want you to tell Peggy happy birthday, and I felt the emotion in your voice as you got to the end of your statement. I have felt that too, because I promise you, I say this to each of you as individuals, I promise you a day will come when our children and grandchildren will look back, and they'll ask one of two questions. Either they will ask, what in God's name were they doing? Didn't they see the evidence? 
didn't they realize that four times in 15 years the entire scientific community of this world issued unanimous reports calling upon them to act? What was wrong with them? Were they too blinded and uh, numbed by the busyness of political life or daily life to, to take a deep breath and look at the reality of what we're facing? Did they think it was perfectly all right to keep dumping 70 million tons every single day of global warming pollution into this Earth's atmosphere? Did they think all the scientists were wrong? What were they thinking? Or they'll ask another question. They may look back and they'll say, how did they find the uncommon moral courage to rise above politics and redeem the promise of American democracy and do what some said was impossible and shake things up and tell the special interests, okay, we've heard you and we're going to do the best we can to take your considerations into account, but we're going to do what's right. I'm going to do my part to make sure that you have all the support that I and lots of other folks can muster for you in both parties when you do the right thing. If some of you in tough districts face pressures that just are overwhelming, I would ask you to walk through that fire. I've got a few specific suggestions that I'd like to make before, um, and thank you for the courtesy of giving me a longer than normal uh, opening statement. First of all, the new evidence let it be said here, that's come out just in the last few months, shows that this may well be even worse than has been described. Three days ago, two new studies were reported in the peer-reviewed science journal, Science Magazine. One of them shows that the Arctic ice cap is melting more rapidly than had been predicted. One of them shows that it could completely disappear in summertime in as little as 34 years. Most of the computer runs, and this is a respected computer modeling group, peer-reviewed, stretch it out 35, 45, 55, could be as little as 34 years. This problem is burning a hole at the top of the world in the ice cover that is one of the principal ways our planet cools itself. If it goes, it won't come back on any time scale relevant to the human species. Another study shows that the Earth is shaking because of what's going on on Greenland. Glacial earthquakes. Seismographers all over the planet are hearing them. In 1993, there were seven of them between four and a half and five on the Richter scale. By 99, the number had doubled to 14. This past year, there were 32, between 4.6 and 5.1 on the Richter scale. One of the uh, Science Magazine articles I referred to points out in detail why the international scientific uh, report decided that it was impossible to include the fate of Greenland and West Antarctica in their projections, because they, un un they don't understand how this could be happening so quickly. 
Another study shows that there are among the billions of tons of frozen methane in the tundra areas that have locked it up in ice, the melting is proceeding more quickly than anyone had predicted. Methane is much more powerful as a global warming gas than CO2, about 23 times, they say, as powerful. We need to turn the thermostat back down before that melts. Fires. Some of y'all from the West have had a terrible time with fires. New study correlates it precisely with the warming temperatures. And not just the warming temperatures, the earlier spring, the earlier melting of the snowpack, and the less uh, and, and the decreased precipitation available to you've got the study there, Congressman. Thank you. Uh, and, and what it shows is that the drier soils lead to drier vegetation, and that means kindling. And the incidence of large fires in the West, in Russia, in Australia. In Australia, they have what some of them are calling a thousand-year drought now. Program of sharp reductions to reach at least 90% reductions by 2050. All of the complex formulas of how we might start reductions years from now and uh, have a little bit in the first year and a little bit more in the second year, I think we need to freeze it right now and then start the reductions. Secondly, I believe, and I know how difficult this is to contemplate, but I believe that we should start using the tax code to reduce taxes on employment and, and production and make up the difference with pollution taxes, principally CO2. Now, I fully understand that this uh, uh, is considered politically impossible, but part of our challenge is to expand the limits of what's possible. Right now, we are discouraging work and encouraging the destruction of the planet's habitability. We are also in a new world, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we've talked many times about the competitive challenges that America faces in an outsourcing world. And with information technology empowering these developing countries with large and fast-growing populations and lower wage rates, our biggest disadvantage is in the area of our high wage rates. And we don't want to lower our wages, but we shouldn't worsen that disadvantage by stacking on top of the wages the full cost of our health and welfare and social programs. I understand this is a longer-term shift, but we ought to start making that shift. It would make us more competitive. It would also discourage pollution while encouraging work. I understand how difficult it is, I'll say again. But carbon pollution is not presently priced into the marketplace. It does not have a price tag. It's considered an externality. And there are reasons for that. But if you think about the externalities, they include air and water. I internalize air and water, as most of us do. And I think the economic system should, too. And I think that one way to do it is by this revenue-neutral tax shift. Third, a portion of those revenues should be, must be earmarked for those in lower-income groups who will have a more difficult time making this transition unless you and the Congress make sure that we are giving them the assistance that they need. Fourth, we need to be part of a strong global treaty. Now, I'm in favor of Kyoto, but I fully understand that Kyoto, as a brand, if you will, has been demonized. I remember, uh, Mr. Chairman, when I, when I first came to this Congress, uh, one of the issues I worked on was nuclear arms control. Some of the members here uh, I worked with closely. In those years, uh, former President Carter had a treaty pending, the SALT II Treaty. 
and for a variety of reasons, including the invasion of Afghanistan by the former Soviet Union, it was withdrawn, and the name itself became a political liability. President Reagan was elected, and I worked uh, across the aisle with President Reagan on arms control. And after only a couple of years in office, he came to a realization, we need nuclear arms control. He had been against it, but the realities uh, of the situation uh, made it clear that we needed to move forward. And he came up with even deeper reductions and a new name called the START Treaty. And people who had been opposed to SALT II all of a sudden were in favor of the START Treaty. I think that we should work toward de facto compliance with Kyoto. If we can ratify it, fine, but again, I understand the difficulty. But we should work toward de facto compliance, and here's my formal proposal. We ought to move forward the date, the starting date of the next treaty, now scheduled to begin in 2012, to 2010, so that whoever is elected president and is sworn in in January of 2009 can use his or her political uh, chips, if you will, all of the, the goodwill that comes out of, uh, the, of that election campaign and the new inauguration, not just on trying to fight a rearguard action in a bitter battle to ratify a treaty that will expire by the time it's ratified, but to work toward de facto compliance and then start an all-out sprint to negotiate and ratify a new tougher treaty that will begin in 2010. And we have to find a way, a creative way, to build more confidence that China and India and the developing nations will be a party to that treaty sooner rather than later. Land cover and methane and soot may be opportunities to have provisions that are binding upon them sooner rather than later. But some creative way must be found uh, to make them a part uh, of this effort. Next, this Congress should enact a moratorium on the construction of any new coal-fired power plant that is not compatible with carbon capture and sequestration. And that means that we should have an all-out push to develop carbon capture and sequestration. Next, I believe, Mr. Chairman, that uh, just as this committee and the Science and Technology Committee were instrumental in the early years uh, of uh, assisting the scientists and engineers to take what was then known as the ARPANET and DARPANET and develop the new switches and the new uh, high-performance computers uh, and assist them in their creation of what became the Internet. I believe that this Congress should develop an electronet, a smart grid, just as the widely distributed processing, processing of information everywhere in this country and around the world led to the biggest new surge of productivity that we've ever seen in this nation, we ought to have a law that allows homeowners and small business people to put up photovoltaic generators and small windmills and any other new sources of widely distributed generation that they can come up with and allow them to sell that electricity into the grid without any artificial caps at a rate that is determined not by a monopsony. Of course, as you know, that's the flip side of a monopoly. You can have the tyranny of a, of a single seller. You can also have the tyranny of a single buyer. And if the utility sets the price, then it will never get off the ground. But if it's a tariff, if it's regulated according to what the market for electricity is, same way public utility commissions do it now, then you might never need another central station generating plant. In the same way that the Internet took off and stimulated the information revolution, we could see a revolution all across this country with small-scale generation of electricity everywhere. Let people sell it. Don't reserve it for the, the, single, uh, the single big seller. Next, 
I believe that we should raise the CAFE standards. And I support uh, your initiative, Congressman Markey, but I support your idea, Chairman Dingell, as well, that it ought to be part of a comprehensive package. And I've taken note of your statements and also uh, some of the uh, automobile industry statements that as long as it's part of a comprehensive package that includes the, the utilities and includes uh, buildings and all the other sources, don't single out cars and trucks and pretend that that's all the problem. It's only a, a slice of the problem, and it's not even the biggest part of it. But it is a big part of it. Make it a part of a comprehensive solution. But let's not bring up the rear anymore on these uh, auto standards. Basically, the problem is cars, coal, and buildings. So you've got to address all, all three of them in an intelligent way. Next, I believe that along with using the tax system and a cap-and-trade treaty approach, you should also not shy away from using uh, the regulatory power. And I believe that this Congress should set a date in the future for the ban on incandescent light bulbs, give the industry enough time to make sure they've got all the socket sizes worked out and all the different features like dimmers and the rest that people want and the quality of life. They'll do it. You set the date. Tell them you're not going to be able to sell that old, inefficient, wasteful kind at, at a set date in the future. They'll adjust. As long as everybody plays by the same rules, they'll adjust and they'll surprise you. Next, where buildings are concerned, I'd like to see you pass a law that I call Connie May, a carbon neutral mortgage association, and here's why. I used to be in a small way in the home building business before when I came back from the Army and before I was elected to the Congress. And the, price, the selling price of a new house is something the market is very sensitive to. Some of you all know this a lot better than I do because you've been in the big business in a bigger way. And so the selling price is what people look at, both the sellers and the buyers. But all of the things that we need to do to cut back down on carbon emissions are things that add to the selling price but don't pay for themselves until a couple or three years have passed. And so the appropriate thickness of insulation, the window treatments, the, uh, the, the, the improvements that will sharply reduce the operating cost of that, that home or building is routinely excluded from the initial purchase price because the market discriminates against it. We ought to set up a carbon neutral mortgage association where all of those costs are set aside. They'll pay for themselves. But just like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, put them in a, uh, uh, an instrument that is separate from the purchase price. And when you go to closing on a house, you sign the mortgage, and they'll say, well, now here's your Connie Mae uh, home improvement package here. You don't have to worry about paying for that because it'll pay for itself. The, the, uh, the Congress of the United States has made sure of that. I recommend that strongly. Next. I think that you ought to require this committee, the Commerce Committee, oversees financial services. I think the SEC ought to require disclosure of carbon emissions in the corporate reporting. This day before yesterday, uh, the largest pension funds in this country, $4 trillion worth of assets uh, managed by them, called upon the SEC and the Congress to require disclosure because it's a material risk. There are lots of companies where investors need to know. If there's a, an exposure to uh, uh, carbon constraints, if uh, they're going to be uh, uh, in real trouble because of some aspect of the climate crisis that they're not disclosing to their investors, stockholders ought to know that, and those, those disclosures uh, ought to be required. Now, I want to close, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you uh, and and thank all of you for, again for the courtesy of allowing me to present these uh, ideas to you. I'd like to close uh, by referring back to the unprecedented nature of the challenge. As many of you know, the, uh, the way the Chinese and the Japanese, both of whom use the so-called kanji characters, 
express the concept of crisis, they use two symbols together. And the first one means danger, and the second one means opportunity. This is the most dangerous crisis we've ever faced, but it is also the greatest opportunity we've ever been confronted with. And there are people who look around the world, Mr. Chairman, and look at the genocide in Darfur and the chronic civil wars in places like Congo fought by child soldiers, and they look at the tens of millions that die of easily preventable diseases and the destruction of the ocean fisheries and the rainforests and these other things, and they say, we just have all these problems. Isn't it, isn't it terrible? Well, there were problems back in those days after World War II as well. But when your generation rose to meet them, the vision they acquired in facing down fascism served them well in giving them the ability to see that these other challenges were not political problems, they were moral imperatives. And that's what our opportunity is today. Not only to solve this and to say to the future generations, we did our part. This was our Thermopylae. We defended civilization's gate. We rose to the challenge. But to also say in the process, we dug deeply and we found a capacity we didn't know we had. It's there. We all know that. And that's what will give us the ability to successfully solve these other crises. That's the greatest opportunity of all that comes out of this climate crisis. It really is up to this Congress, and Mr. Chairman, and to all of you, I cannot possibly overstate the, the, the strength of the hope and good feeling that people all over this country have about this Congress and the new approach that they feel is being taken here. And. I'm going to be out there, as I said, trying to stir up as much support for you all doing the right thing as I possibly can. I wish you well as you undertake this historic challenge. Thank you.